Well, congratulations. You made it through uh, the seventh week. Seven is the number of completion. <laughs> so this will be the last class until January. We'll pick it back up again, and uh, I hope it's been worth the investment of your time. We sure love doing it, and uh, my wife was just telling me what an awesome meeting that the pastoral care team had today, ministering to somebody, and you know, if you were here Sunday, you heard Debbie give her testimony, and uh, you know, it's just amazing how God can just keep shifting things in our lives if we stay open, and, and we're, you know, keep an open ear to what he's saying to us, um, sometimes directly, sometimes through a prophetic word, that was what happened with Debbie, my wife had a prophetic word for her, saw that actually, Trisha didn't say it this way, but what she said to Debbie at the time was, I see a pauper spirit on you, and, and I want to break it off. And that's very similar to that, uh, that curse that we've been talking about the last two weeks. So, um, you know, tonight I'm just going to cover some things that I didn't get to talk about much. Um, I, I could use somebody if you could just bring me an extra handout, if you have an, uh, an extra handout, and then I'll... You know, maybe you could just get another one from the back because I left mine down there. Thank you. <clears throat> this, uh, these two things I'll, I'll t kind of touch on near the end, but they, they're things that you can take with you, and they illustrate a lot of the principles that we've been talking about. Uh, I, I realized kind of later in my walk with the Lord about what happened um, when God blessed the church with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we know that's in the second chapter of Acts, right? And uh, a mighty rushing wind, a sound like a mighty rushing wind came down, and those flames of fire appeared over their heads. And, and we, went, we went from the Old Testament to the New Testament version of God's presence in our lives, right? We really, the first part of the, of the Gospels is still the Old Testament because until Jesus rose from the dead, Death hadn't been defeated, right? We didn't really have the fullness of the new covenant until he resurrected. Once he resurrected, that defeated the death that Satan brought into the Garden of Eden back in the book of Genesis. And he actually said to the disciples, it's good that I go because if I go, what, what will happen? Uh, I'll send the comforter to come for you. And the advocate, right? We know him as the paraclete, the advocate. This part of the Godhead that's now going to be burning on the inside of you. So instead of you having to go to a temple and ask the priest to make a sacrifice on your behalf and, and go into the Holy of Holies, Jesus took his own blood and brought it into the tabernacle in heaven and put his blood on the Holy of Holies. One died once for all, right? And then released the Holy Spirit so that you and I are now the temple. We don't go to the temple. We are the temple. So, you know, what? A lot of people have been talking to me in the last couple of days and saying, man, stuff's been getting stirred up <laughs> between the class and the last two Sundays, you know, talking about breaking curses. And uh, the one guy said to me this morning, it's just like I want to remove the obstacles so I can get all of what God has for me. And I really couldn't think of a better way to say it than that because we know in our walk that we have had moments of mediocrity let's just say it like that we didn't lose our salvation but we weren't thriving in our walk with God and you can say well you know we're human beings and we make mistakes and that's true we do but there's just certain habits and certain disciplines that you can have that can help optimize your walk with the Lord and and some of it is really about disciplines and what you will allow yourself to do and what you will say no I'm not going to do that I'm not going to watch certain kinds of movies I'm not going to listen to certain kind of music and you could say that's legalistic you know, that's fine, but you better be aware that there's a war going on. So it just always made me wonder why on the day of Pentecost, the first miracle, in addition to seeing flames of fire over their head, which was another sign that our bodies are going to be the temple, right? Because there's an eternal flame in the Holy of Holies, right? On, on that tabernacle, right at that mercy seat, there's a fire that never goes out. And that's the fire of God on the inside of you. But what does that need? It needs oxygen and it needs fuel. And, and that's what we give him when we, when we yield to the Holy Spirit and we say, you can have it all. I'm not going to hold this part of my life back to you and only give you part of me. You gave all of you, Jesus, for me, so I'm giving all of me to you. And whatever that means, wherever the chips may fall, and where the chips fall when this works is that you prosper in your life because there's a blessing in obedience. I mean, just what Debbie said, I don't know if you caught all of what Trisha was saying to her, but it wasn't even just that her boss gave her the condominium after 
that day, Trisha said that the Lord's going to give you an inheritance. That very same day on that Sunday, the, the boss was talking to his wife at home at the same time we were praying here and said, we want to give Debbie an inheritance. And the next day he told her, but he didn't, she didn't just get the inheritance as if that wasn't enough. She got a big bonus in her paycheck. Then her stove hadn't been working for years. That just automatically started working. And her washing machine had been leaking, and that stopped leaking. So it's like the goodness of God just hits in all these different areas. And here I go again. But, but like, why were they speaking in unknown languages to them? They were speaking known languages, but not something they had ever been taught before, right? That's a miracle. And we've heard of people in the modern age that that's happened to them that God has just downloaded the knowledge of a, of a different language, a known language. They were speaking fluently. And many times, I'm sure you've heard too, that somebody would be in a meeting and speak in tongues, and another part of a person that was in the meeting would come up and say, when did you learn how to speak Chinese or, or French? And you go, what are you talking about? I have no idea what you're talking about. He goes, oh, when you prayed, you were praying in perfect French or whatever. Like, why? Well, what was the significance that it was a known language that you had never been taught? I believe, this is just my theory, I haven't really backed it up with a lot of research, but it's because God cares so much about people that he wants to use his spirit to drop inside of us a fluency to be able to talk to them in a way that they know it has to be God speaking through us. That's what Holy Spirit does. That was the very first thing that happened was an ability to increase, like exponentially increase communication between two people with no training. So what does that mean? Like, how does that transfer to 2019, about to be 2020? Can you believe it? It's about to be 2020. I can remember worrying about Y2K. <laughs> right? Like the, the doomsayers, man. It was good. Everything with the planes were going to crash. The whole thing was blowing up. Nothing happened. Yeah, I know. A bunch of worry warts. So what I'm going to just try to translate, you know, we've been talking a lot about pain for the last six weeks because, you know, if you realize that you've been fed a bunch of performance orientation in your life and you've been working so hard but for the wrong reasons to try to earn love, like that's a hard thing to come to grips with and, and you deal with these stages of a process where you get angry about it and you have to forgive the person and we talked about forgiveness, right? The, if you go to that first slide, Marissa, it's just a, a review of the last six weeks on a topic level, one more, yeah. So we first talked about the fact that God wants us to walk through a process of transformation, but to do that, we get sanctified. We, we separate ourselves out for the Lord. We don't, like in the morning, we don't, when we get to work, say, okay, God, thanks for being with me on the ride to work, but I got to go to work now, and I can't bring you in there with me, but I'll see you at five when I get in the car again. No, right? He's with you all the time. We walk in a holy life. Be ye holy as I am holy. That's what the Lord wants us to do. That's not easy to do in our culture, is it? But that's what, that's what sanctification is, is setting ourselves apart for the Lord. And then transformation is what happens to us as we change. I mentioned performance orientation already, and that's that man-pleasing spirit where people will, will use their uh, affection. They'll withhold their affection from you to get you to work harder, and then they'll reward you with a little crumb. <laughs> and, like, if, if you perform well, I'll give you more, but I'll only give you more if you perform well. That's not unconditional love. And then we come in the kingdom, and we don't realize that God doesn't do that. So we try to earn his love by working harder and joining more ministries and, and all these things. And it's just, uh, it's a fool's errand, they would say in the business world, because you can't get God to love you anymore by what you do. He already loves you unconditionally. But does he want you to do? Yes, of course, but not out of fear. We're not operating out of fear in order to impress other people. We're operating out of love. And when you love somebody, you want to please them. And that's part of the reverence that we have. It's not fear of the Lord in a way where we think he's going to strike us. It's, it's a reverence and a respect for the Lord that, hey, you saved my life. So I could certainly give back to you by taking whatever talents that you've given me and pouring them back out into the kingdom. Forgiveness, we went through. Uh, I know uh, Cindy did a great job with forgiveness and bitter root judgments. And then generational sins and um, parental inversion is what we talked about last week. But when John and Cheryl were here, they talked about generational sins. And then when Trisha preached on Sunday, uh, so yeah, two Sundays, like a bonus, talking about the generational sins. 
and I'm happy to take any questions about any of what you guys have heard in the whole class if you want to tonight. But what I wanted to do tonight is take a look at like what's the practical next steps. Let's say we don't meet again for another five weeks, right? We go through the holidays and busy time of year, Christmas parties, family that you're seeing, maybe people coming in from out of town. Maybe you'll get a vacation or some time off, which is nice, right? If you don't use it, you lose it. So people use up their days. And we get bonuses at the end of the year, which is nice. So it's a great time of year. But you also come, you know, you cross paths with people that you might not see that often. And, and I think that fluency idea the, of, the, of the book of Acts when they got filled with the spirit and all of a sudden they knew how to communicate with people at an intimate, deep level. Because they had accents, okay? They were from Galilee. They were kind of hillbilly kind of people. So for them to be in Jerusalem with the educated people and not only speak their language, but speak it fluently right down to the dialect of where these people had traveled from in other countries, they, everybody knew that was a miracle because they weren't educated people. So what about us? What if you're with your CEO at the Christmas party? Wouldn't you think that God would want to give you a word for that man or woman? The answer is yes. You're his temple walking around on the earth. He loves that person. Why wouldn't he want to use you to speak to them? And, you know, often in the Bible it says when you open your mouth, he will fill it. But it's a little scary, isn't it? Because you're afraid you're going to say something wrong or make a fool of yourself or embarrass yourself. And, and, you know, most of the time those people don't like the fact that nobody wants to engage with them because they're afraid. And I know I do a lot of teaching, and the younger generation, when you ask an open-ended question, when I was in high school, a bunch of people used to shoot their hand up. Didn't mean they had the right answer, but at least they were willing to try, right? But nowadays, people are afraid to even raise their hand up. Dead silence, and that's not good. Like We want to live our lives in a way where we're hungry to learn and, and interact. So I just believe that's one of the takeaways from the last six weeks is that we should be willing to let God speak through us, that you have to do it scared sometimes, you're not always exactly sure what to say, but to believe that when you open your mouth, he will fill it with his words, and that you can have a very seriously positive impact on the people around you, because you're a conduit for what God wants to say to them. And it's filtered through the word. I think my Bible's down front there, but the word of God is your filter. John's going to give it to me. Thank you. And anytime you're about to say something, you want to make sure it lines up with the grid. And you only get that by studying this book, you know, and memorizing scripture and making it a really important part of your life so that you're not saying anything contrary when you're speaking to these people, especially unsafe people. And you're giving them the principles of truth of the word of God. I just said it to somebody today. Uh, the Bible says, guard your heart for out of it flow the issues of life. And that's a principle unsafe people can understand. Because if the condition of your heart is wrong, that can lead you into sin. And they get what sin means, too, because they know who Harvey Weinstein is. And, you know, they, there's, there's you know, headlines of people that are committing sins all the time, missing the mark, right, abusing their authority that they have. So the concept of sin's not far from, from the unsaved people. And look, they don't even have to be unsaved. They might just be marginal Christians. They might be people that have been hurt in church. Have you ever talked to somebody and said, oh, I gave up on church a long time ago? Yeah, right? Because they got hurt. Because church is run by people, and people are fallible, unfortunately. But just tell them, don't throw Jesus out with the bathwater, right? It's about Jesus. It's about the Bible. Church is going to be flawed. There's going to be flawed people running churches. But look at how God has caused the church to grow, even with flawed people. So we look past that and we look at the gathering together with other believers, like-minded, enthusiastic people that really are striving to serve God, striving in a good way. to say, Lord, I want to please you. When I see you, I want to hear you say what? Well done. well done. Good and faithful servant. Not because you had all these degrees or because you made more money than somebody else, but because I saw your heart. Man looks at the outside. God looks at the heart. So out of the heart flows the issues of life. So guard your heart. See, you can make it real practical to people, but you have to exercise those muscles. You have to try. You have to do it. So that's what I said. We're tracking for fruit-to-root patterns. So we say it often in this class. If there's fruit, there's a root. So what might be an example of that? 
as you're just dealing with people on an, on an everyday basis. Don't make me call on people here. Anger. Okay, so if you find yourself getting angry a lot, driving on the roads around here, right? That could be road rage. Has that ever happened to anybody? Uh, yeah. Because if somebody's watching this in Oklahoma right now and they live out in the farm country out there, maybe they don't know what we're talking about. But people around here drive like maniacs. And if you ever drive into New York City, they're maniacs on steroids. They ignore all the rules, don't they? You, I could say you could lose your salvation, but you won't lose your salvation. But there's times that yeah, you might feel like you're getting close. And like all of a sudden now, the condition of your heart really comes into it. So if you find yourself losing your temper often, that's fruit. But the root is more complicated than that, right? We know that's not the behavior God wants us to operate in because he's the prince of peace. And peace and anger don't go so well together. Now, it doesn't mean that anger is necessarily wrong because we know that Jesus never sinned. But it says often in scripture that he was angry with people. So it's possible to be angry and not sin. But it's also possible to sin <laughs> in your anger, right? And we have to be really careful not to get hijacked in our emotions. So what we want to try to do is find out why am I angry so much? There's some resentment that I'm holding on to. There's something that I stuffed down. Well, why would God withhold that from you if you asked him? He wouldn't. He loves you. He's a good father. He won't withhold it from you. Now, it could be that really tough things happened to you when you were younger, and you might be blocking some things, right? Why do we do that when we go through trauma? John? Hurt, pain. We do it to survive because we have to block it out. It, it hurts too much. And in order just to function, we, you, we, we just put it on the side in, in order to just cope. That's what they call it. It's a coping mechanism. It's really not so much denial as it is if you're a little child and you've been physically or sexually abused. You don't know how to process that, but you still have to get up and go to school tomorrow, and you still have to study for this test. And you, you might still be facing the person who's been abusing you if it's one of your parents. So you're living in this hyper like alert state of fear, and then you get older and you block some of that stuff out because you almost have to in order to continue to function, but it doesn't go away. So when would God bring that out to you to remind you? When he feels you're ready to handle it. And when you've been showing him that you're anxious to try to change and that you see the fruit of this thing, but you haven't made the connection back to the root. So this is a really good prayer. Lord, anywhere where I'm not lining up with how you want me to behave, there, that's fruit, but I don't know the root, and most of us don't on our own. We're not good at diagnosing this ourselves. How many are married? Your spouse will be really good at helping you diagnose this, <laughs> okay? And, and why is that? Because opposites attract. Anybody here marry somebody opposite personality? You know I did, because you all know my marriage. Right? So what's good about that is that they see life through a different lens. So they can, they can uh, assess your behavior better than you can often because they're watching you and they love you. So they don't want you to keep functioning in dysfunction. They want you to improve and, and get rid of that root. So if you're open and you're willing to ask, you know, the Bible, I love this. It says that God is close to those of a broken spirit and a contrite heart. What do we think he means by that? Because initially, when you hear broken spirit, that sounds like a really big negative. Like, who wants to be around somebody with a broken spirit, right? But, but it, contrite is really the key there. Remember the act of contrition? If you grew up Catholic, you had to say the act of contrition, that you were basically saying that you were sorry. So contrite just means, oh, I realized now that I'm adult that when I was younger, certain things happened to me that are you know, translating into this unhealthy behavior now that I'm adult, and I realize I've hurt a lot of people because of my anger. That's a broken spirit, but that's humility, and it's an ability to go to them and say, I'm really sorry I did that. Will you forgive me? And if somebody asks you, will you forgive me, don't say, oh, it's okay. It wasn't such a big deal, because that's not true most of the time. Say, well, thank you for apologizing to me. That did hurt when you treated me that way, but I forgive you. It's really important to complete the transaction, all right, and not pretend that it really didn't bother you. And now that, that's where the Lord will give you language on that side too, is that, oh, I'm, I'm humbled by realizing that I'm not who I thought I was. 
And that's not such a bad thing because we're getting out of the wrong identity that's still got these controlling you know, negative behavior patterns and we're getting into his identity. And to do that, some things have to die that we thought were really important. And that's why death, burial, and resurrection, it's not just Jesus, it's my anger has to go to the cross. We don't fix the anger, we crucify it. And that goes to the cross and we come out the other side resurrected a new person who doesn't sin in our anger when it works and it does work. So what are the next steps? How should you operate in the next five or six weeks when we're not meeting and maybe you know there's not as much teaching on this available? I tried to write down some things about goals and a practical application of, what, of how we can use the things that we've been learning in the last five, six weeks. And one of them is just to keep a spiritual awareness moving forward, all right? Be um, self-aware. Many people are not, I'm, I'm sorry to say. They, they just kind of are, are trying to function to get through life, but they're not assessing their behavior in the moment very well. They're not alert to how they're behaving because they're so conditioned to behaving a certain way that, that they lack self-awareness. That's not a good sign for a Christian because we have Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit is alerting us if we have our, our, our ears turned on. John and Cheryl have a grandchild and said, uh, pop up, I'm turning my ears off to you right now. <laughs> because she was, he was correcting her about something and she didn't want to hear it. And I thought that was a good sign. But we have to turn our ears on to the Holy Spirit so that our spirit man is open to what he's saying to us so that we can be self-aware. How about listening skills? How important is that? On a scale of 1 to 10, it's a 10. And for a Christian, it's really a 10. And if you're an active listener, if you're really looking at people in the eye and you're, and you're listening to them when they say your name, like I was just in a meeting yesterday, and the man met people when we walked in, six different people he had never met before. Then a seventh person walked in, and he introduced all six people by their first name. First time. That's impressive. Because he was paying attention. He was actively listening. He cared. He wasn't so worried about what he was going to say that he was missing what everybody else was saying. If anybody should be active listeners, it's us. We have Spirit of God on the inside of us. He's a good listener. <laughs> and he wants us to be too. So that's what I mean by spiritual awareness. Read the situation that you walk into. Have discernment about the situation. And, and it's always different. So you just can't assume that because it was this way one time that it's going to be this way again. It, it always has its own separate temperature each time you walk in. You've been, maybe you have, I certainly have walked into a room full of people in, in like a boardroom setting and known that an argument just happened. Even though they're not yelling at each other now, but there's a coldness and they're not looking at each other and they're like, you know, hustling and bustling around. And you didn't hear it, but you knew it happened. So you tell a joke. <laughs> you do something to try to lighten the atmosphere. And, and that will work sometimes, right? Just be careful. Be aware is my main point here. Um, so then I'm just quoting the Sanfords here. It says, we must not discern solely by what the eyes see or the ears hear, but rather must use gifts of Holy Spirit insight to penetrate beyond events and circumstances. We must look as God does where? Upon the heart, okay? Now, I'll tell you another story of a, of a brilliant psychologist named Do Dr. John Gottman. And uh, he's a Jewish, uh, practicing Jewish man. So he, he operates off the principles of the Bible, but he's not a born-again Christian. But he's, like I said, he's just a brilliant, under he understands human behavior really well. So one night, he's uh, reading this novel in bed, and his wife was in the ba uh, bathroom, you know, getting ready to go to bed. And he wanted to finish the end of this mystery novel that he was reading. But he knew he had to go brush his teeth and, and do his little routine. But he wanted to finish it, but he had to get in there first to do it. And he was just going to rush in the bathroom, brush his teeth, and get back so he could finish reading this book. And when he goes in there, he looks at his wife, who he'd been married to at the time for over 30 years, and he picked up on something. He could tell that she was really sad, and he didn't know why. And he said, I had a little struggle because part of me wanted to go back and finish reading the book. But part of me knew that my wife was hurting about something and I didn't know why. Now, you know, ladies, that there's a lot of ways men could approach you in that situation that wouldn't feel like a good fit. 
But this guy, I thought, was beautiful, the way he handled it. All he did, she was combing her hair and looking at herself in the mirror. He just walked over and took the brush out of her hand and started brushing her hair. That's brilliant. That's really sensitive, see? And, and now she was much more open to, you know, if he said, what's wrong? I could tell something's bothering you. Do you want to talk about it? That act of kindness, that tenderness, let her know you're on my wavelength right now as opposed to what's wrong with you, right? Guys, we could be pretty tone deaf. You got Holy Spirit in you. So what this man calls that is a sliding door moment. I think of that often. It's such a brilliant Christian concept, too, because God will open up these opportunities for you, and you have to be alert to the Holy Spirit and step through that door because it's not going to stay open. It's going to shut. And he had a moment there where he stepped into it, and he, he was hearing from God. He probably wouldn't say it the way we would say it, but God tenderized his heart towards his wife. All of a sudden, that novel didn't mean so much anymore. Because in that moment, he knew somebody he really cared about was hurting, and he wanted to share that. Now, it doesn't hurt that they're both psychologists. So they both know a lot about how people are wired, and, and they really, truly love each other, right? So that, that matters. It really matters. But what about God? Does he love people? Yeah. Way more than we do. <laughs> Unconditionally. So if we're going to represent him, then we got to love people too. doesn't mean that everything they do is okay. Because if you love him, sometimes you have to be firm. Jesus said to that woman caught in adultery, go and sin no more. It wasn't the only time he said it. There was other times he confronted people about it, but he did it in love. All right, we getting there? All right, so what's the next one? Act of Holy Spirit listening. And then uh, it says, we will see the importance of listening and establishing the trust necessary to allow people to share their lives. And remember, this is in the context of tracking from the fruit that's up on the surface to the root. Anybody here cut your, cut your lawn? You mow your lawn? Gardening? And you get dandelions in the spring? What, what good does it do to, to mow your lawn with dandelions? Zero good. Why? You didn't get to the root. See? So it's really easy to understand this principle, isn't it? Because if you just cut the surface off, the thing's going to grow right back again because you never dealt with the real root of the issue. And that's what people do. They medicate their pain by cutting the, the dandelion off with alcohol or pornography or whatever, whatever can distract them long enough to forget about the problem that they have. So that's kind of just kicking the can down the road. I'll deal with it tomorrow. But no, it takes some courage to go after the root of that thing. But once you get the root, it doesn't grow back anymore, does it? So you disempower it. And that's what God wants for us. So this could be for yourself or it could be for people that you really love and care about. And man, it's powerful when you see the Lord use you to help reveal somebody else's root system of what they're dealing with. Easter's not in her head because you see the light go on in their brain. Like, oh my God, that's what this is. And now all of a sudden they have a target to shoot after and we can give them some weapons, especially this one, you know, because a lot of the times the problem is lies that people believe and they have to renew their minds with the word of God. And instead of hearing what the devil keeps telling you about yourself, you hear what God tells you about you. So they said this, the Sanford said, sensitive listening occurs in three ways. We listen with our minds, but then with our empathetic personal spirits. So the example I gave you of that man going in the bathroom, his spirit was empathetic to what his wife was feeling. Anybody want to tell me the difference between sympathy and empathy? You're like that class I was talking about. Nobody wants to raise your hand. So sympathy. All right, Diane, go ahead. I'll, I'll repeat it. Yep. So, so, well, let's say sympathy first is pity. Right, So your friend falls in a hole, and you're standing there going, wow, that looks really bad down there. I really feel bad for you down in that hole. See you later. Hope you get out. <laughs> right? <laughs> Empathy is different. Empathy sees the person in the hole and says, I'm jumping down in the hole with you, and I'm going to feel what you're feeling. And that is much harder than just feeling sorry for somebody, isn't it? And if you really do feel, and the Lord is good at helping you feel what other people are feeling if you ask him, 
And now all of a sudden you don't feel so critical of them anymore because he's actually letting you feel what they're feeling, especially if it's grief. That's one of those emotions that we're not taught to handle well, including over things that are not just a death, but like even, believe it or not, retirement can cause grief in people's life. They're, while they're working, they say, oh, you could take this job and you know what the rest of that song said. Uh, but then they stop working and all of a sudden they realize when they retire that their, their whole identity was tied up in being the executive guy that had the assistants and people working for them. And now they're standing online at 7-Eleven getting the paper and coffee with all the other guys in the morning. It's like, who am I? And, and they lose their identity because they didn't take the time to invest in their own identity, they put their identity in what they did, but your identity is not in what you do, it's who you are, according to God's plan, right? So this could be a great way that you as a Christian can minister to them as a friend and say, you're way more than what you did for a career. There's a hundred opportunities to serve, to serve as a volunteer now that you're retired. You can use all that experience and all that uh, wisdom that you gained in, in, in business to come in and come alongside a cause that you believe in. And, you know, most ministries are, are really needing that kind of help. So it's just how, it's how you look at life. It's, it, what, it's what lens you look through. So empathetic spirit. Just come up to the mic, Manny. Welcome back, brother. Good to have you back. You got to turn it on, brother. Learned in church, but I've learned through life as a Christian. When you don't become empathetic to a situation, or you're the cause of that situation, or somebody walks away grieved, you open a door for attack to yourself. Right. And I don't think a lot of people understand that there needs to be repentance immediately. Or right. Else somewhere during the course of your day, you're going to get tripped up. And I say that because this morning I had a bit of a situation where I asked one of my employees to do something, and he gave me an excuse that somebody else said that they didn't need it done. And I looked at him and said, I told you to do it, and I wanted it done. Now, whether I was right or wrong, it didn't matter. The way I approached him about it, it upset him. And he went off in a huff and went to do what I told him to do. But as I'm looking out the window watching him, just something in my spirit said, you need to resolve this. You need to either apologize or go talk to him. So I did. And, you know, it brang both of us from here down here, which I believe kind of bring healing and close the door. Right. But nobody ever teaches you that. So. No, they taste the opposite, especially for men. I mean, you know, that would be a sign of weakness to admit that you made a mistake in, in our culture. And that's the biggest, you know, no-no for a man is to have somebody think you're weak because, you know, that's feminine to say you're sorry. That's just a lie. Like I said, you know, that's a lie. You have to tear down that high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. You have to pull down that stronghold because, let me tell you, that was a witness to that guy. You didn't preach the gospel, but you lived out what a Christian does. And that's what a broken spirit and a contrite heart is. Like, hey, man, that's not who I want to be. I don't want to be pulling rank on you. That's because in years past, I suffered not repenting. There you go. See? So that's the difference between a Christian and an, and an unbeliever is if, if you're a Christian and you're open to God and you're listening to what he's telling you, you're changing over time. You're softening over time because that's his goal is to make us more like him. But if you don't have that, you know, Patricia looked at me the other day and said, oh, my God, I can't believe, you know, she got to feel the hopelessness of an unbeliever that we were with and the pain that this person was in. And she's like, oh, my God, I felt that hopelessness just for a minute. I'm so glad I'm saved. And you can't forget that. Amen. We're, we're here to be ambassadors for Christ. Part of that is empathy and feeling their pain with them, but then showing them how to get out of that hole. Right. Don't just go in the hole with them even though it's much harder to get in the hole with them because you got to stop whatever else you were doing to get in that hole. But now I'm going to help you get out of this thing. And if somebody's depressed, by the way, like you telling them to sing worship songs might not be the best thing because they're already kind of condemning themselves. Maybe the best thing to do would be to cry with them. And all of a sudden that thing can lift off them. It's biblical, right? Weep with those who weep. Rejoice with those who rejoice. 
Third one is that we listen with an ear to what God wants to tell us. So first with our minds, we size up the situation. Then the empathy. Is this one of those sliding door moments? Yes, often it is. And then the third thing is, what is God saying is the combination to this lock? Because every situation has a different combination to the lock. It keeps changing. And unless you're listening really closely, you, you could say things that are not destructive, but it won't necessarily be redemptive in that moment because that, that happened to me. I know that because I, would just, I was trained when I prayed with people to just quote scripture. That's not a bad thing, but it's too systematic. It, it, it's too programmatic. It's like a recipe. And, and, and with God, the recipe is different every time. You, you can't fit them in a box like that. And it's never wrong to quote scripture, but it just was a little too base level. He wants us to be way more dynamic to, to apply to each situation. All right. And then that listening will, um, I'm sorry, results in information gathering, which will lead us to areas of the woundedness in that person's heart or in our own hearts and help us to recognize the fruit to the root pattern. All right. That's the big theme tonight is the fruit to the root. And, um, uh, I'm going to just use some scripture now to try to illustrate this. So it says right in Matthew 7, just to prove the point, you will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grape from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Now, I'm sure you've read that, right? Not, new, not a new verse to most people, but... You know, it's pretty profound, even though it looks pretty obvious, right? A good tree produces good fruit. Bad tree produces bad fruit. Seems obvious, but it's back to this idea that a tree is going to produce fruit, period. You can't stop it. It's not trying to produce fruit. It's a natural result of that thing being there. It's like going, mm, come out, you apple. Come out. Boom. And then the apple comes in. No. It's not forcing anything to come out. It's a natural result of being alive is that tree produces fruit. So what's the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Anybody? Joy, peace, patience, kindness. A lot of you know this one. Temperance is that last one, right? Ooh, that's a hard one. Now, if your roots are good, those things are going to just flow naturally from you. You can't try to be it. You have to do what gets it there. So what gets good fruit is a good tree. Well, what does a good tree have? It's, got, it's watered. It's protected from the elements. It's got uh, fertilizer coming in on it. And it's got a husbandman. <laughs> and pruning. Oh, the pruning. No one likes the pruning. So hey, the ones he loves, he prunes, right? So that's, that's the idea. See, I don't try to control the behavior. I control the inputs. I, I make sure my life is protected and that I'm surrounded by good life-giving relationships. And, and, you know, that enemy can't attack me because I'm surrounded by people who love me and, and I'm not opening myself up to storms, <laughs> right? That's what's going to get the fruit in my life, the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the goodness, all the things that you all memorize. That's wonderful. But it's not so easy just to take a class on that because the class is on sanctification, transformation, forgiveness. When I'm operating in a healthy culture like that, then all of a sudden the fruit just automatically comes out good. You get the point? Okay. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? So what? Just translate that to a, an example. Anybody got one? I can think of one. I'll tell you. Let's just say Mariah Carey was here. She's one of the best singers in the world, to my knowledge. And I said, sing it off key. <laughs> she did it. She's such a good singer. It would be really hard for her to sing a wrong note because she's trained her whole life to, to sing it the right way. Plenty of other people, you wouldn't have to tell them to sing it the wrong way, right? We always recognize them. But for somebody who's conditioned and has a spirit of excellence on them, they produce good fruit because everything's working right. They, they got everything lined up. A good tree produces good, can't produce bad fruit. Wow. That's a challenge, huh? That's Jesus. He never produced bad fruit. And that's who we're aiming to be. 
so I don't beat myself up if I produce bad fruit. I say, okay, Lord, what's the root? Help me get to that bottom of where that came from because you love me. You don't want me producing bad fruit. Yes, Bequia. Did you get your notebook, by the way? It wasn't mine. I think it oh, was. Oh, was it wasn't yours? Okay, I sorry. I think it was. Um, oh, good. All right, good. So I'm glad somebody got it. Yeah. The right person, I should say. The right person. I guessed. I was off by two seats. Yeah, it was Aaron. <laughs> okay, so um, family. Right. You love them and right. you want to be around them. But it is toxic. And you're like, well, surround yourself with good relationships. But that's family. And then when you go around people that love you, like personal example, they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, but they show you love. Right. You know? Understood. It's a, it's a, a thin little needle that we're trying to thread here, right? Because we're missionaries in that we're representing Jesus to hurting people that don't know him. And they're going to they're gonna behave in ways that we find really re repulsive sometimes. But if we can ask the Lord, show me what you see when you look at my family members so that I see what you see when I look at them. And instead of me having contempt for them, I can have mercy on them. Because mercy, your mercy will triumph over judgment. Doesn't mean that you tell them what they're doing is okay. But you can do it with an open hand and say, you know, what you're doing to me is really painful. And I can't stay in this situation if you keep doing it. Right? That's different than saying fighting fire with fire. If they're well, nasty to you, you I get nasty I think I meant there. like if I'm with my mother and her family, it's right. always some darts going to fly and you got to duck. Right. If I'm with my godmother, her family's loving, caring, but they pass in Hennessy. You know what I mean? Right. But very loving, caring, sweet, warm. I love being around them, but things are going in every direction, but they're so nice. Until the third bottle is empty, and then maybe... No, oh, they're really? still okay. nice. Well, they're they get rare. happier and happier okay. and happier. <laughs> well, then I'll say till the next day when they got the hangover, <laughs> and they're not so happy. It's just different. It's I like get the it. love no, I do. is unconditional, I'm not minimizing it's not the nice point. stuff going on. Sure. But it's weird because they're saying things like, remember that verse, be quiet? Let's talk about it. And I'm like, okay, let's pray. Oh, wait, I was drinking. Can we pray? I'm like, yeah, let's pray. It's okay that you were drinking. Right. Noah was a drunk. And they're like, he was? Like, really? Well, you may, no. you may not jump right to prayer all the time, right? Because that, that might be going from a one to a 10. You might need to go to step two and three no, and no. get them there. They're asking for this stuff while they I hear drunk. you. Look, you know, I can't give you a specific answer in a specific situation. I can give you general rules. So the general rule is if it's, if it's called a sin in here, it's a sin. So if they're getting drunk, that's a sin. Correct. It's not okay. Even though their outcome might be happy and loving, that's like it's an assisted thing. It's, it's not realistic, and you can't live well like that for long. That's going to catch up with you, right? So you can't be real condemning about it. Because then all of a sudden they're going to talk about all your problems. But you could just try to show them there's a better way. And it's not an easy answer to what you're asking. But all of us face these kind of really, like, wide is the road that leads to destruction. Narrow is the road that leads to life. We're trying to get them on that narrow road that leads to life. It might take 100 encounters for you being with them before they say, wow, I don't know what you have. But whatever it is, I want it. What do you have? It's hard to do it in one meeting. I mean, Jesus did it. But we're not Jesus all the time. So we got to be willing to just keep modifying our behavior. Let them see the Jesus in you is the best way I could say it. Because i got a bunch more i got to keep going got through, it. okay? Mandy, you have another question? Well, just the, just Microphone so people can hear you. You know, the Bible says that a prophet has no honor in his own home. True. So the closest people to you are going to be the ones that are most contentious. Some, yeah, I mean, right. I, it's hard until to put a general rule. Cycle. It can happen. Yeah, until they hurt you the most for sure. Because they know what buttons. They know the buttons. But they right. can also help you the most. But well, what I've learned is that if you can break that barrier, then it becomes even easier to witness to people oh, who are hurting out there. Definitely. All right. So then the rest of that goes on to say, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruit, you will know them. So this is no joke, right? I mean, the way I read that is to say, he expects me to keep on this track. And if I wasn't bearing good fruit five years ago and I'm still not bearing good fruit, that's a problem because I'm supposed to be being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. All right. 
I really love this one in the message. It's 1 Corinthians 9. It says, even though I'm free of the demands and expectations of everyone, I have voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people. This is key. I didn't take on their way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ, but I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. <laughs> Man, that really sums it up. That's the message version of the Bible. Okay, like that really nails it for me because I'm working in a secular workforce. I'm surrounded, right, Dan? Get more secular than our business? Not, not, not too much more secular. So like you're with people that are, are living off a way different map, a way different rule book. They want to go out and get drunk after work, and they want to take the client out and get the client drunk because if we don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. This isn't a way to live, right? We know that. And yet, how can Daniel prosper in Babylon? He said, I'm not eating your food. And he was made the head of the whole deal, right? So people will see that difference on you. Even if they mock you in the beginning, they're just testing you. They're testing you. It's like, yeah, man, go ahead. I get it. Or, or you really want to get convicted, get the movie. Um, ah, sorry. I'll think of it. Hacksaw Ridge. Oh, my God. You want to get convicted about a guy who took it and just kept taking the beatings that they were giving him and lived out Christ for them and ended up saving their lives, if you know the movie. It's a little graphic. I'll warn you. It's a war movie, and it's too graphic for, for most people, actually. But the part about this man living out his Christian walk, unbelievable. True story, too. And, and it's just amazing because the real people that he saved were still alive. You know, this was World War II. At the end of the movie, the guy that was harassing him the most is sitting in front of the camera and he's crying. And he's going, I can't believe he would save me after the way I treated him. I was dying on the battlefield and he came and risked his life to come and get me. See, that's such a beautiful image. And then there's a scene where none of the soldiers are ready to go yet. And the, the general calls and says, why haven't you taken that hill yet? He said, we're waiting. The guy said, you're, they were supposed to start 15 minutes ago. Why didn't you start? He said, we're waiting. You're waiting for what? I gave you the order to go. We're waiting for Dawes. He's praying. <laughs> we're not going until he gives us the green light. They knew, had the re they knew how, who had the real authority. It wasn't the general. It was a guy who knew how to hear from God. True story. See, that's what we need. We need those people that set the bar for us. Mother Teresa, you know, you name it, like these heroes of the faith that said, I'm following Jesus. You know, you can have the whole world, but I'm following Jesus. And man, that's the person who just shines. And, and there it is. I kept my bearings in Christ, but I entered their world. I mean, Jesus could have said that. I kept my bearings in the Father, but I entered your world. I never sinned, but I entered a world that was corrupted with sin. And yet when Mary is grieving over her brother dying, he weeps. He felt the grief of humanity over that. And he knew he was going to raise the brother from the dead, right? Lazarus. And uh, he still wept. Why? Because he identified with Mary. And he identified with her pain. And sometimes weeping with somebody could be the best, kindest thing you could do, right? Man, he could have said, don't, don't cry. He'll be alive again. No, he wanted, he wanted to live our lives and feel what we feel because so, he knows everything about us now, see? He walked in our shoes. I'm going to just skip a little ahead. This is really key. Ephesians 4, he himself gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. For what? Say it with me. The equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That was very weak, class. I'm sorry. Let's do it again. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's much better. Thank you. You all get a gold star. <laughs> and a free bagel after church on Sunday. <laughs> so I have to be equipped, right? I come in and I'm born again, but I'm a baby. And I have to go from milk to the meat. And a great way to do that is getting involved in ministry and, and just serving the, the kingdom somehow, acting like this foot washer, you know, Jesus, our king. I love the contrast here. He's the king of kings, and he's washing Peter's feet. He's a servant king. 
we, we learn his character by serving other people. And you could have a really important big law firm job in New York City, and all of a sudden you come and you serve in the children's ministry here. And you're working with people who aren't so fully qualified. But we're all part of the body of Christ. We're all in life-giving relationship with each other. We don't look down on each other because of our education or our rank or whatever. We just operate together, and the Lord allows us to flow together. And we learn from that person that's different than we are, that we didn't expect to learn from, but God could speak through a donkey. <laughs> so speak through anybody to us if we're willing to just humble ourselves and do it, right? So this is really key. Being equipped is, is an ongoing, lifelong process. Equipping the saints for the work, I heard a, a scholar say, for the work of their ministry, not just open-ended work of the ministry, but the work of Jim's ministry. I'm supposed to equip him for his, and John, and Easter, and each one of you, part of my role is helping equip you for your ministry. Just like you raise your children up in the way they should go. And they're all different, right? So you can't just place one little cookie cutter on each one of them. And that takes a lot of work, doesn't it? Because you got to hear the Lord about what that person's ministry should be. And look, you know, like that can be really controlling too. Somebody could say, I think you should go do this. Look, you don't have final say. God has final say. But the minister should be there as a guide to help that person. This is what I see in you. This is the gifts I'm seeing in you. We want to help you cultivate that gift. We want to equip you for the work of your ministry. Because when people are equipped in the right zone, that edifies the whole body of Christ. What's the end? That 14 says that we should no longer be children that are tossed to and fro. Right? If you're not equipped... You don't know what to listen to. And, you you know, there's all kinds of things. It reminds me of my field, which is economics. And people are saying, what do you think the market's going to do? I heard this guy say this. <laughs> well, you can hear any guy say anything at any time. Somebody's predicting a crash. Somebody else predicting a boom. Somebody's saying buy gold. Somebody else saying do this. And half the time, they're just trying to sell a product. And, man, it's really confusing. So people get all caught up with this stuff. So I don't want to be tossed to and fro. I want to be anchored to true north. This is the compass. This is my guide. That gets me through the, the storms. And, you know, I got my hand on the rudder, but he's got his hand on it with me. And that's getting me through this whole thing. I don't want to be tossed to and fro. But speaking the truth, we may do what? May a little louder. One more. That's it, right? See, that's a milk to the meat. By, by being equipped by these gifts that God gave to the body of Christ, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, in this, in this example, they're equipping us so that we can not be tossed around, that we can get through these problems in life, navigate the problems, and then we can grow up into the thing, all things into him who is the head, who is Christ. And I love 16. From whom the whole body joined and knit together, but while every joint supplies. So all these different gifts get knit together in this huge, big tapestry because all of us are being equipped in the way we should go and not being cookie-cuttered into what the pastor thinks you should do, right? But in the, in the gift that, that God gave you, when that's flowing properly, that produces fruit for the kingdom of God because you've got a bunch of energized people that have been equipped in the right zone, and they're all operating together, and it produces fruit. Every part does its share. Oh, I love it. I'm going to read 16 again. From whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. What a great package. This whole little chapter is just this beautiful process of growing. But if Jim's not hitting his optimum goal, we're not hitting it together as a church because he's still operating at a six when he could be at a nine, let's say. You get my point? Not performance-wise, but just who he is and who he's supposed to be. We were together last night. And I said, how are you doing? He goes, I'm so excited about what's going on in the church right now. And man, I would love to hear that answer from every person that I talk to, right? And I said, well, why? What do you think? And he just listed off a bunch of things just because that's, that's what he's been focusing on. So that's a good sign, right? That, that's the equipping process that's working. And then we want to give an avenue to everybody for that. But here's what's hard. And, and I'm trying to give you like practical follow-up steps, right? So when you meet somebody in the body of Christ who's very different than you, you could sometimes look down on them a little bit. 
because you're operating in one gift and they're operating in a very different gift and you don't always appreciate the value of their gift to the body of Christ. <laughs> Just going to let you think about it for a minute. Because we tend to think that our gift is the best one. <laughs> so I'm up here and, and I'm like getting into leading worship and like I'm having a blast. And people are out there, when is this going to end? This service is going too long. The worship's going too long. Rah, 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 rah. Yeah, oh, wow, you'd be surprised. I could read that on their face sometimes. <laughs> I'm like, well, just come late next week. You know, miss, miss the worship if you don't like this part. But I'm going to have fun because I love doing it. <laughs> so they don't always appreciate that one, right? Uh, they could talk to the pastor about it. Maybe it'll change. I don't know. I doubt it. <laughs> so they're just in a church where we, we like to worship. You know, that's the deal. But that's, that's a small part that I'm talking about because now we think about the prophetic gift and then compare that to the administrative gift. They're really opposite. Many times. I'm not always because people are too complex to, to make overall general comparisons, but tendencies and traits or that prophetic people tend to be living in that zone of hearing from the Lord, and they can lose track of time easily, couldn't they? Did that ever happen to you with a prophetic person? I'm sorry I was late. You're an hour late. <laughs> I know. I was praying, and I lost track of time. Now, aren't we glad they're praying? Especially if they're praying for me. Like, that's really good. But the meeting was supposed to start an hour ago, and the Bible says... Let your yes be yes. If you said you were going to be there at 8, don't come at 9. And they didn't even say they're sorry they're late. Right. <laughs> I, I've heard this happens in people's lives. Yeah, I, I can't relate. <laughs> but then they come in and they give you a prophetic word that nails you. Because they were spending so much time with the Lord. And go, maybe it wasn't so important that we started at 8, you know. Because I don't know if we would have heard from the Lord. Now, so you see what I mean? Like there's a redemptive part of everybody's gift. But when you're really like locked into yours, you see everything through your lens. And then you could devalue the gifts in other people. But God doesn't. Now that doesn't mean we should all be late for all the meetings. I, I, I'm not saying it is an excuse. <laughs> Because really, it, it's rude. It is. If you're holding up the whole deal, then you kind of lose the authority to have that position. Because being on time is crucial. So you could just, you know, anybody play golf? Yeah, you know, sometimes if you know that you always hook the ball, you aim that way. So you tell them it starts at 7, and they'll get there at 8. And it was going to start at 8 all along, right? That's lying. You can't do that either. I've tried it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like that old nature creeps up again. So this, that next one is really good, Marissa. If you could just put the next one up. This has been really super helpful little uh, graph for me. And I'll, I'm happy to send these slides to you if, it, if you think it would help. Yes. Um, yeah, so Marissa, can you just make it a point? Because we have everybody's emails here just to send them the slides. Um, all right, so anybody remember Dawson Trotman and the Navigators? Uh, when you were in college, did you have a campus ministry called Navigators? Yeah, some of you do. It's like Young Life and others. He was a brilliant man, and, and he led thousands of soldiers, uh, mostly Navy people, to the Lord because he was based in San Diego, and he would talk to them before they would ship out in World War II. They were going to battle, and a lot of them, you know, knew that some of us are going to die. So they were very open to hear the gospel. And he came up with a way to just illustrate it for them that said, look, Jim, I'll just use Jim as an example. He's on the front row here. You're going into battle now, and you're, you're a Christian, but I can't mentor you anymore because I'm staying here and you're going out on this ship. But while you're on that ship, there's certain things, disciplines that you need to think about. And he would draw a circle. And he, and he would put Jesus in the middle, and he said, Jesus has to be the center of everything that you're doing, and the circle is obedience. So you want to obey everything Jesus tells you to do. Brilliant, right? That, that's a good way to, uh, to include it. And he says there's four things 
in addition to Jesus being the center, that you have to do. The first thing you have to do is find other Christians on the boat and make sure that you're in fellowship with them. The next thing is you got to study the Word of God. The next thing is you got to pray, and then you have to share your faith with other people. This was over years and years of leading so many people. He had to come, come up with a, a, a brief way of trying to hit all the really important things, and this is what he came up with. And it exactly overlays with Ephesians 4. I don't think he knew it did, but this was the revelation that hit me was, wait a minute, this is the fivefold ministry, right? Apostle is at the center. That's Jesus. Prophet is the prayer and worship up at the top. Uh, evangel apostle, prophet, evangelist is the outreach part about sharing your faith. Uh, teacher is the one who shares the word of God. And then fellowship with other people is the pastoral role, right? Now, anybody here identify yourself primarily as one of those gifts? Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. There's even spiritual gift tests that you can take that, that'll measure this for you. Yeah. Philip, you're saying yes. What was your test result? teacher okay anybody else got one that you want to share that you feel is your dominant gift evangelism okay that's a good one i'll just stop there for a minute so let's just say we have the classic evangelist and the classic teacher right and we're we're sitting for coffee after service and i go hey philip how's things going he's like oh man it's great i just i just got two commentaries in the mail and i spent 4 hours yesterday studying these commentaries cuz i'm preparing my message to teach my class next week and and diane's going i say hey how's it going diane oh amazing i led four people to the lord yesterday when i was out at the mall 4 hours four people <laughs> see like they both are in their zone but neither one is better than the other because each part of the body has to do their part. But she could look at him and go, oh, you wasted four hours studying a commentary? I led four people to the Lord. And you're like, yeah, but I'm writing a book, and I'm going to lead 4,000 to the Lord when they read my book. <laughs> <laughs> and that actually happened with two people that I, well, one I knew really well. Uh, Peter Wagner had written 75 books by the time he died. So he would get on a plane with his friend, John Wimber, who was an evangelist. So it's just funny that the first two people said those two gifts, right? So Peter Wagner, before he was getting on the plane, would pray, Lord, help me have a seat so that I, the seat next to me is empty so I can write another book while I'm on this plane. John Wimber's sitting right there next to him in the lobby waiting to get on the plane. And he's going, Lord, put me next to an unbeliever because I want to lead somebody to the Lord. And then they would be jealous of each other's gifts. Because Peter would say, oh, my God, I, I went on this plane, and I didn't even, I had a cold heart towards them. And John would say, I went on this plane. I led one person to the Lord, but he's going to see thousands of people impacted by his book. See, there's always a less than feeling somewhere. But if you're just comfortable in who God made you to be, and you just get equipped in your gift, then your ministry is going to be productive. And we all need to be planted in our own pot. <laughs> and then we produce different kinds of fruit, right? So what I'm saying with this is, be careful that you don't despise other people's gifts when they're different than you. But look at it as a redemptive gift in the body of Christ that's just different than mine. And I am sure glad we have prophetic intercessory praying people in this church, even though that's not my primary gift. I'm way more like what Philip was saying and the studying and the preparing the lessons and, and trying to come up with ways to convey the truth. And they're spending more of their time just listening and hearing God and, and giving direction for the church. But apostles and prophets have to work together. If you think about Paul, he was a classic apostle. He would go into a region, he would start a church, he'd raise up a bunch of elders, he'd make sure it was, it was off the ground and going well, and then he'd leave. And then he'd go start again. That's what an apostolic gift does. It oversees, it starts things, it plants things, it oversees multiple groups of churches. There's a gift there for that, right? If you don't have that gift, you'll be miserable trying to operate in that, right? So... That's all I'm saying is that make this a practical part. Like ask the Lord when you're talking to somebody else, what gifts do they have, God? And bless them for their gifts instead of saying, oh, my God, I can't believe these people. They're so annoying. They're always late for the meetings <laughs> or whatever. See, like now you're judging. And you already learned about that one, right? So I'm going to kind of wind it down a little bit now because... Uh, the longer you study the word, the more humbling it is because you realize things that you thought the Bible meant, they don't always mean. <laughs> so don't think you know it all. 
obviously study it to show yourself approved, but be willing to, uh, to recognize that it's somewhat like a multifaceted diamond. Depending on which way you're looking at it, it could show you a different thing. And, and there's a lot of truth in that book that we haven't fully been, that hasn't fully been revealed to us yet. Not weird doctrine stuff, but just this was written thousands of years ago, right? So if we don't fully get what they're saying, we could misread it and misapply it, right? So that's why it says in James, be not many masters. Be careful if you're going to be a teacher because you're going to be held up to a higher accountability, right? That's an important concept. So you all probably know this. This is part of the Sermon on the Mount which starts in Matthew chapter 5. And all of Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is three chapters, one sermon. Now, the thing about a sermon is it's got a coherence to it. It's not a collection of random sayings. It's got a start, a middle, and a finish. And chapter 7 is the beginning of the last part of the sermon. And you know 5 is when it says that they were on a mountain and Jesus sat down and he started to teach them and he went through the Beatitudes, right? Blessed are the poor. You know, you, you've probably all studied this. And then it's very coherent through five, six, and seven, but that this first part of seven could get misread, which it covers some of the things we talked about in our class. So that's, that's why I want to bring it out. And the first one is judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. We talked about that in this class, right? Bitter root judgments. Be careful. It's very convicting. And then Jesus is saying, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but you don't consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, there's a plank in your eye? That's convicting, isn't it? And then he says, hypocrite. Anybody know what the Greek word there is? An actor. An actor. Somebody who's got a mask on. That's not Jesus, is it? Jesus is the true, authentic, real person that he wants us all to be. So be careful. A religious spirit can put, cause us to put masks on. He's saying, no, strip that stuff off. Be comfortable in who you are. Stop wearing Saul's armor. Remember that one? Like, you don't have to wear Saul's armor. You're good with a slingshot. So you be you. And take that hypocrite mask off. Don't worry about fixing everybody else. Work on yourself. Right? Really good truth, isn't it? <laughs> First, remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now, remember, this is a sermon, and we're winding down towards the finish line here. At the end, he says, anyone who listens, hears my words and does them is like a man who built his house on a rock. The storm comes, the wind blows, and the house still stands. But whoever doesn't listen is like the one who built it on the sand. Remember this, right? So we're building up to that conclusion now, and this is the beginning of that last piece of it. So it starts by saying, don't judge people, and, and, and work on yourself first. And then it's, um, I missed one there. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 6. Anybody got it? I missed it, I, I guess, on the slides that I sent. Can you go to the next one, Maris? I might have put it in on this one. Yeah, there it is. Okay. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Anybody preached on this one? Anybody heard a message on this? What, what do you think it means? He's heard conflicting messages. It might take 100 interactions. Right. Right. Beautiful. That's what I was hoping you'd say, because there are, you know, a lot of people have only heard the second one that you said, which was, hey, you've tried witnessing to somebody. They won't hear it. Don't take the pearl of the word of God and cast it before that swine. But doesn't that just not register in your heart? Like, even though it's apparently what it's saying on the surface, it's got to be taken within the context of the bigger sermon that he's preaching here, right? So then it goes to the next part of it, which we all know. Ha, huh, that's why. Okay. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be open. What man is there among you who if he son asks for bread, he will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, he will give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who's in heaven give good gifts, I'm sorry, good things to those who ask him? Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, also do to them, for this is the law and the prophets. 
All right, so it looks like there's a couple of different sections to this sermon, doesn't it? To this part of the sermon. The first part was very clear. Don't judge unless you'll be judged. Then this curveball comes in about casting your pearls before swine. And, and he basically says, they'll turn and tear you to pieces. And then he goes to ask, seek, and, and knock, right? Which we know is about prayer. And then he finishes with the golden rule. Verse 12, that would be a standalone verse that, that the whole world knows about treat other people the way you want to be treated. It's classic. Matthew 7, 12, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. So many times people that are looking for a Bible teaching will take little sections of the Bible and they'll say, okay, today we're going to teach on judge, not judging. And they'll take Matthew 7, 1 through 5, and that's the teaching, and it stands alone. And then they'll say, I want to teach about prayer. And they'll take Matthew 7, 7 through 10, ask, seek, and knock, and that's about prayer, right? They rarely talk about don't cast what's holy to the dogs because I don't think they know what it means. And then they say golden rule. So there's four different messages right in there, but that's a problem. <laughs> that's like me operating on Philip and taking his heart out and putting somebody else's heart in, right? Like, wait a minute, this doesn't work if you pull it apart. It works if you keep it in sync with each other. And I only know this because I've really had my, I've been humbled and I've read other commentators and put some things together that like, wow, it's way more, complex than we realize how God wants us to treat other people, especially the part about casting your pearls before swine. And why am I saying this? Because sometimes when you're operating with a person whose gift mix is very different than yours, and we could think about politics here for a minute. Can we get real? Yeah. Thank you. And you're a staunch whatever, and they're a staunch opposite of that, and now it can get really ugly and it shouldn't, even if you disagree, it shouldn't get down to a personal level where you think that person's an idiot because they don't agree with you. They're not an idiot. I promise you, they're not. They just have a different grid that they're looking at life through than you do. And it's not that different than different gifts in the body of Christ. And if Jesus had done that, remember when the apostle said, Lord, you want us to cast fire down on them? <laughs> Push the button, man. Nuke them. He said, you don't know what spirit's in you. I didn't come to destroy lives. I came to save lives. We're his ambassadors. Same thing. So here's a different way to look at those 12 verses, OK? I'll just give you the quick summary. And I'll use my work example because I've used it before. So in my business, they attract a lot of young guys that are real aggressive, good looking, articulate. It's a sales position, pretty much. And they set the bar high for them, and they hope that these guys get in debt. They encourage them to go out and get a, an expensive car so that they have a lot of debt, so that they have big payments to make, so that they'll make their number and make their sales. They're, they're basically rewarding them for being aggressive. And, and these guys are competing like gladiators because every Monday there's a sales meeting and they, they bring in the, the alpha male who had the most numbers last week. It's the song of Rocky. Da, 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 da. And here's the guy who led the sales last week. And he gets carried in on a chariot, you know, like on one of those carts. Not really, but it feels like that. <laughs> and then here's the guy who lost the, the sales contest who had the lowest numbers last week. And he looks like the hunchback in Notre Dame. You know, like he's being shamed, like openly shamed. I'm telling you, it's bad, right? So what does that tell you? Like, I'm not going to be the last one next week. I don't care what I have to do. I'm making my number. And that means ethical violations and all kinds of other things that could happen. So here's Christian Pete working at this desk with his big black King James Bible. And here's this young stud guy who comes in, and he's going to conquer the world and buy a Ferrari and sleeping with his girlfriend on the weekends and staying up late and doing drugs and, you know, like live, burning the candle at both ends. And Christian Pete comes over and says, brother, you're in a big mess. <laughs> you're a fornicator. Not only are you a fornicator, you're going to get that girl pregnant and then you're going to have an abortion, and then you're going to be a murderer. You should be more like me. 
huh? What planet did you land from? See what I'm saying? But this is how Christians are perceived sometimes. Judgmental. Why are you judging the guy next to you? Don't you realize you've got a plank in your own eye? That's what the Lord could be saying to me because I'm not looking at him with compassion. I'm not seeing him as a sheep without a shepherd. I'm coming down on him from the mountain. You are sin and you're going to burn. Right? That's how Christians come across to people. And that would be the first thing the unbelievers would tell you is the thing they don't like is that they think we're judgmental. Why don't they say they're the most loving group of people on the planet? More missionaries have come from the Christian church than anywhere else. More sacrifice, more giving, Red Cross. There's a crisis down south, a flood. The churches are emptying out and going to help all those people. How come they don't think about that? I'll leave that as an open-ended question. So what they should be thinking about us instead, because in our zeal to be obedient to the Great Commission and preach the gospel, we're totally unaware of the way we're presenting it. So, oh, I'm not going to cast my pearl before this swine. So I'm going to ask, seek, and knock. Who else can I go convert? Not good, is it? How about it was this way? I'm looking at this kid, and I'm saying, Lord, man, he's hurting. But it's so easy to be on this track. He's a good-looking guy. He's smart. He's making money. He's very charismatic. He's not going to understand if I tell him he shouldn't be sleeping with his girlfriend unless we have a relationship first. I'm asking, and I'm seeking, and I'm knocking on the door of heaven to get a strategy that I could speak to this guy. Because if I cast the pearl before him, and, and in this version, the pearl would be my lectures about everything he's doing wrong, my pearls of wisdom that I've learned from all my years of experience. He's like, that's not edible. A pig can't eat a pearl. But what can they eat? <laughs> you. <laughs> you see what he's saying? Lest they turn and tear you to pieces. Because then he's going to say, wait a minute. You're going to tell me how to live? I heard you on the phone last week talking to your wife. We won't go there, will we? And now you're going to be Judge Judy? <laughs> no. Instead of throwing your lectures at this kid and judging him, why don't you ask me for the combination to the lock of his heart? Why don't you ask him to go out to lunch? Why don't you get to know his name and find out what school he went to instead of thinking that you have this position of authority where you could just come in, blow right past the relationship stuff because, oh, well, you know, if I'm a friend with a sinner, I'm a friend of the world, and a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Really? That's a misread? You're a missionary in that place. You're an ambassador of Christ. And if you take the time to build a relationship, then all of a sudden you're not lecturing him. You're like a, a wise older brother that's giving him really good advice. Now it's a pearl of wisdom to him, right? Because then he can digest it. Because treat that person the way you'd want to be treated if you were them. Ha! Oh, it's really hard. Because when we read it, it says, whatever you want men to do to you, do to them. Not the best reading of the verse. Pretend you're them. How do you want to be treated? Big difference, right? Because based on my gift mix, I'm a teacher. I want, to be t I want people to like me as a teacher and give me a syllabus. <laughs> a prophetic person is like, syllabus schmillabus. I want to hear from the Lord. <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't know how you spell schmillabus, but you got the point. See, I hope... I hope I'm connecting it for you. You're going to meet these people. The next six weeks, you're going to get a lot of sliding door moments. And if you come in like the hypocrite with the mask on, judging people, it's not going to go well. Ask the Lord, what do you see when you look at them? I know I've repeated that a million times, but that's really the condensed version of this. When I looked at that kid, instead of seeing him being in a mess, have empathy for them. Look for an open door, not to manipulate them, because you really do have good news, don't you, for that guy. All right, so I'm late. I'm sorry. It's 830. Quickly, let me just show you this. So turn to the part that has the graph on it, as opposed to the two boxes. And this is called the angle scale. And anybody that's watching, if you email us, we'll, uh, we'll send you this handout. I'm not going to go through it in detail.
But it really does a nice job of illustrating the different ways that you need to approach people based on how you assess where they're at with the Lord. Okay, so if we're talking about what Diane said, she's an evangelist. Somebody who's a minus eight at the top has an awareness that there's a God, but no effective knowledge of the gospel. Then you get to a minus five as you come down this scale. You see how it works? And they're getting closer and closer to being ready to, to accept the Lord. So a five is somebody who grasps the implication of the gospel. A three is starting to, to wrestle with the, the decision of saying, yes, what's that going to mean? I'm going to have to change my life. And then when somebody gets to a minus one, they're ready. See, so you don't speak to a person who's a minus eight the same way you would to a minus one. But when you're meeting with them, like that hundred uh, repetition example is, you, as long as you're moving them closer to making the decision, you're having an impact for the kingdom. And I'm guaranteeing most of us in this room, it was not the first time we heard it, we said yes. Is that true? Anybody? First time you heard it? One person. First time you heard it. The rest of us here, there was a process of breaking down our defenses, right? And that wrestling with God. And the person who's witnessing to you has to be aware of that and, and appropriate to the situation and speak to them. Now, you may be able to move them all the way in one conversation. That's awesome. If you can do that, that's a great gift. But the point is, even if they're saved, that's on the other side, the new creation side, you still don't deal with everybody the same way. You assess them. Where are they? Ask the Lord, what's the next step for this person? Be a missionary in Africa? Probably not. Right? That's the big thing everybody seems to fear. So we'll cover this when we, when we come back after the break. And then the other side is just brilliant. And you can read it because you'll get it just by reading it yourself. It's just so... Uh, it was just a wonderful way they made the analogy that I'll just summarize real quickly. You don't have to read it, but let, just look up at me for a minute, okay? So on one column, it talks about learning a foreign language and the steps. They've identified steps in the process. It typically takes five years to become fluent in a foreign language if you're starting from a dead stop, okay? That's a long time, isn't it? Yeah. And that's a lot of frustration. And then there's several points in the process where you want to quit, and they compare that to discipleship in Christ. That's also a process. And we don't have to beat ourselves up if we're not going fast enough in the process because we're learning a whole new way of thinking and a whole new way of being and acting, and we have to get rid of some of those bad old habits. So if we don't get mad at people for not learning a foreign language fast enough, we shouldn't get mad at ourselves for not progressing fast enough. And there's several points in the process where you want to quit similarly to a language, right? So that's all I'm saying is let's have compassion on each other. Let's not expect us all to be Mother Teresa or, you know, the guy in the movie that I quoted from Hacksaw Ridge or whoever you want to use as the example of a really, like, amazing Christian. Be who you are, but don't be the same tomorrow as you were today. Be a little closer to Jesus tomorrow, hopefully a lot closer to Jesus. And as long as that is going in the right direction, you see just amazing fruit, right? And then you don't want to go back to the counterfeit after you had the real thing.